Good afternoon. I am, not only am I the president of TEAM, the Trenton Ecumenical Area Ministry, which is very much involved in uh, putting legs to the ground of uh, this issue through a project called Healing Communities, whereby we train congregations, we train religious congregations to better affect the to better serve those in their congregations who have been impacted by crime, incarceration, and prisoner reentry. But prior to that, I spent 13 years as a full-time prison chaplain, which meant that I pastored inmates and their families. So what I'd like to do is to share with you just a few vignettes that put a human face on the broad realities that you just heard. I once married a couple whose son had been conceived in prison. Yes, it does happen. This had happened about 12 years before. This young man was about 11 years old and had never spent even one night at home with his father because his father had been incarcerated literally all of his life. When the wedding ceremony, which took place in the prison chapel, was over, the boy asked his father, Will you be able to come home now, Daddy? It was as if the boy had reasoned that his father's continued incarceration was due to his failure to marry the boy's mother. I also supervised but didn't perform another wedding in which the couple had had several children prior to the man's incarceration, but they had never gotten married. As a result of his crime, which was a murder, he was given a life sentence. However, the mother of his children, who considered them married, in her words, from the very beginning, spent the next 26 years visiting him in prison, raising their children, and helping with the grandchildren who eventually came along. In short, she served as the matriarch of that clan. She was a beautiful, dignified woman who reared her family by the sheer force of her considerable will. On their wedding day, the sight of three generations of that family gathered together, again in the prison chapel, was overwhelming. One of my seminary interns, who was a student right here at Princeton Seminary, who was himself a former gang member and had been reared without his father, fled from the room because, fled from the room in tears because the scene was so beautiful. At the request, at the request of one of my inmate members of one of the inmate members of my church council. I once brokered a meeting between, the, between this inmate and his younger brother who had been, who was incarcerated in the same prison. The older inmate, who I believe was in his late 20s or early 30s, had been the patriarchal figure in a fatherless home that included his mother and several younger siblings. He was also the head of a criminal enterprise that included virtually the entire family. Upon being charged with his crimes, he took the weight for the entire family and drew an exceedingly long prison sentence. But in the course of his incarceration, the lack of his presence in the home and on the street brought additional hardship on the family, which led his younger brother to become even more immersed in what is commonly called the game. The purpose of this meeting which, took place, which again took place in the prison chapel, was to facilitate a reconciliation between the two brothers. This, was, this reconciliation was necessary because the younger brother's abandonment issues had caused him to act out in ways that could have gotten him killed by other inmates. The next thing I'd like to read is an article titled Dear Son a letter from an incarcerated father. This is a letter which was written by a member of my inmate congregation at New Jersey State Prison, right, in, right down in Trenton. And what this young man had done is he read this during, as a meditation during one of our Sunday worship services. And he writes, Dear Son, from the time I found out you were conceived until today, this letter has been 10 years in the making. I often wondered when the time would be right for this conversation. Should I have waited until you have a, a beard or a mustache? No. 
Even though you're still small in stature and young in age, lately all of our conversations have shown me that you comprehend and adhere to the father-son relationship more than I did at the same age. But you are still a boy, my boy. And it's up to me to pass on to you something that I, when I was a child, wasn't privy to. You see, my father was never there for me. I never knew him. I had no concept of who to emulate, no role model to look to. Everything I learned about being a man wasn't passed on to me by any man. Instead, it was thrust upon me by my environment, my situations, and oh yeah, my mother and grandmother. But I don't want that for you, my son. I don't want for you to be in an environment or situation that you aren't familiar with. Whether it's your own experience or information passed down to you, I want you to be equipped with the knowledge and wherewithal to make the right decisions. This isn't easy. Even though I'm excited to be writing this letter, there is still a part of me that feels like I've betrayed you. Can you please forgive me? My hope was to do this face to face, but given my current situation, that's not possible. And now my prayer is that this information will guide you on your way to becoming a man. My legacy, the inheritance I'm passing on to you, I expect you will pass on down to your son and he to his son and so on. Now remember son, this information is priceless. It's a bond that should never be severed or broken. It must last for an eternity. And since we are the founding father and son, this is our pact, a tradition like no other. So a high standard must be established for our future generations to attain, uphold, and protect forever. Let me continue by acknowledging a pillar of stability in your life, who is your mother. I know she's been a true constant in your life. She's been there for your first step, your first word, even your first tooth. She's been there for all your good times and bad times. All your birthdays, she was there. She was there to pick you up when you fell, and just like my mother, she will always be there. In fact, she is a super mom. Still, she isn't me, your father. Nor does she want to be the man in your life, the man you love, the one you call dad. Every time I think of you, I hate my situation more. I hate the fact that your memories are developing without me. I don't know what kind of memories you have of me you have, but they shouldn't be of a father who hasn't been there for any of your birthdays. The world we live in isn't perfect, and neither are the choices I've made. When I was younger, I thought I was so smart. Not wanting to listen to anyone, I've made decisions based not on what was right, but on my own self-gratification. And as I've gotten older, I realized that the things for which I risked life and limb weren't the things I needed in the first place. Son, despite what you believe, I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes. I can never change that. But I must go on living because the God I serve is an all-knowing God and he knows my heart. He knows I love you dearly. He knows you are a good son. And no matter how much your mother or I prepare you, you are going to make your own mistakes. So when you, choose, so when you find yourself in a situation where all you have to go on is your experience, your faith, and your instincts, choose well, knowing that the decisions you make are going to have a long-term impact and will change the lives of those you love and cherish. For now, I'll leave you with this. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. It also says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse six, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. These two scriptures, son, will be the foundation of our lives. They are to comfort us when we mourn, Fill us when we hunger and thirst, and guide us when we are lost. I love you, my son. Now go, let your light shine bright. Dad, thank you.